All right, welcome to The Golden Shadow, everyone. My name is Aaron Rogerson. I'm here with Alyssa Polizzi. And today we are welcoming back our friend and guest, Sam Hines. Sam Hines holds a master's in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness from the California Institute of Integral Studies and is currently pursuing his PhD in clinical psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute. He is training in ketamine-assisted therapy at Sage Institute in Berkeley, California where psychedelic therapy is approached through the lenses of psychodynamic, post-colonial, Jungian, and archetypal psychologies. And that's what we're gonna get into today. Uh, Sam was on the show previously, episode 53. If you wanna check that out, that was his uh, discussion on psychedelic therapy, which was a really good discussion. So Sam, welcome back to the show. How's it going? You gotta unmute yourself before you answer. Yeah, good to be back. Thanks for having me back on. Good to see both of you. Things are going good. Excited to wrap awesome. up that element a little bit. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, so tell us about James Hillman. Who was James Hillman? So James Hillman is, I think, foremost known as the initiator of what's called archetypal psychology. Um, he tends to be situated sometimes as like a post-Jungian by other people. There's a book by Andrew Samuels called Jung and the Post-Jungians. And I'd say like Hillman is the most prominent and probably most well-known and original of the uh, post-Jungian thinkers. He trained um, at the Jung Institute in Zurich in the 50s and then was involved in the Institute like through the 60s. So he was like steeped in the classical Jungian kind of central place for about 20 years. And then he in the 70s started the Dal in Texas, the Dallas Institute for Culture and the Humanities. Um, that's where Spring Journal uh, was based out of, which was kind of arch archetypal psychology's main uh, publishing house. Um, it was also during the 70s that he gave the Terry Lectures at Yale, which became the material that went into his main book, Revisioning Psychology. Uh, then later he lectured at uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute and he died like just over a decade ago, I think. Yes, yeah, so that's that's in general who who James Hillman is. Um, there's a lot more to to dive into, of course. But I'm curious, Sam, for you to explain a little bit about your relationship with James Hillman's work, um, especially given your background and your studies. Um, being able to view Hillman both uh, from a clinical point of view, but also from a more philosophical or personal point of view and really how did impact how did his work impact you as you first came on and how do you see yourself implementing it into the work that you do moving forward hmm. yeah it's a good question so i first came across james hillman uh, he was mentioned by richard tarnas who i was studying with at ciis in san francisco um and Rick said that revisioning psychology is a book that every person should have on their shelf and should revisit. Uh, they should read it multiple times. Um, so that was all I needed to hear. And I checked out the book. Um, and if there was one thing uh, in, James, in James Hillman's entire work that I would want to direct people to, if you're not gonna read anything else, just read the little introduction to revisioning psychology. It's not 10 pages long and it's very brilliant. Um, he just had a really, his pose is, his prose is uh, just very beautiful. And he has a way of elucidating the psyche uh, and archetypes in a way that few other writers or thinkers are able to. Um, I was also, being exposed to Jung at that time. Um, and so he was an interesting kind of counterbalance to Jung's perspective. Um, there's a lot of similarities between them. And he did, you know, call Jung one of the father, he designated Jung as one of the fathers of archetypal psychology at one point, uh, repeatedly did. Um, though he also uh, gestured to, to Henry Corbin uh, as one of the other main fathers of um, archetypal psychology. And that really 
traces back to like Neoplatonism. Uh, and in particular, like the Renaissance Neoplatonists were really central to Hillman. And that's kind of where his, his approach uh, to Jung's begins to differ. Um, and just to state uh, to your question about how it maybe influences, I mean, I, I can go into like the philosophical background. We can talk about the ideas that uh, inform Hillman and kind of give that context. But the clinical piece is very interesting. And when it comes to therapeutic practice, because you know, for, for Hillman, what brings people into therapy and the way that you would might think about a therapeutics of archetypal psychology, it's really about getting away from the notion that there's something to be cured or something to be fixed and that the sufferings that bring people into therapy to begin with are, they're metaphorical. Um, that it's the way that human beings uh, partake in the sufferings that actually just belong to soul itself, that belong to images, that there, that there is a dimension to human experience that's rooted in soul, but soul goes beyond human beings. It's not that the soul is something that, that's inside the human being and even necessarily needs to be cured or needs to be fixed, but that the sufferings lead people into therapy because it's soul calling people back for attention, for its, to, bring, to bring attention to it. And there's more of a, he, he emphasizes care of the soul rather than curing. So like this idea that uh, care of the soul is more understanding the, I guess like the, the metaphorical, poetic and transpersonal basis of our suffering, that when we recognize that there's an archetypal image at work and the things that trouble us, um, it somehow depersonalizes a little a bit, it deliteralizes it. And then that's kind of where the liberation comes in. So caring for the soul is really attending to the things that plague us uh, almost in a kind of aesthetic sort of way. We connect to something greater than ourselves when we follow where our suffering is nagging us to go. And the whole idea is that that pulls us out of our ego. It pulls us out of the way that we literalize our lives and over concretize our lives and forget that there's actually a um, archetypal source to all of our experience that's always at work that underlying any ex soul. Uh, Hillman would say that soul deepens events into experiences. So it's the, it's the way that the things that happen to us take on a depth, they take on a richness, they take on a meaning um, that is rooted in a, a deeper kind of archetypal source. Um, and therapeutics is just trying to illuminate that from Hillman's perspective. And I, I guess the like as an example of this, um, Hillman talks a lot about soul making. That's he, he thinks about his archetypal psychology as a psychology of soul making. That term comes from the romantic poet John Keats, the English romantic poet, in a letter he was writing to his brother. And Keats famously wrote, "Call the world, if you will, the soul of the veil of soul making." So if you th think about Keats, uh, he died young of tuberculosis. And he wrote these like four fantastic odes um, at that time. And one of them in particular, Ode to a Nightingale, is just a, a beautiful poem. It's like this fugue of incredibly rich imagery. And if you just kind of read it fast and just let your uh, attention just kind of bleed over it, it's just like this really rich, really beautiful dream. But there's also a sense that his the suffering that Keats was going through in dying of tuberculosis, he found a poetic basis for it. He immortalized the suffering he was going through by finding its basis in the imagination. Um, and so there's a way that when you read that poem by Keats, like you're reading the root of <clears throat> the roots that he traced his own suffering to, but finding that your own imagination is able to connect to it and that there's something timeless, there's something immortal about it. So that would be like an act of soul making. So that Keats Keats found, he also said, there are two things I, I believe in, which are the affections of the heart and the truth of the imagination. And so th that's Keats rooting his mortal experience of suffering in the truth of the imagination. 
uh, that's sort of what soul making gets at. And that's kind of what therapeutics is about for Hillman, I think. We try to find the truth of the imagination at work and the things that plague us and that don't seem to go away. Um, and that analysis is, is getting at that um, transpersonal, impersonal dimension of imagination at work in our psyches and lives. So. Well, lots of good stuff in there. Um, yeah, I want to get into the sort of differences between Jung and Hillman. And there is kind of this, um, if you're going to greatly simplify it, that there's kind of this feeling of Jung kind of like moving towards like a center point and kind of just like having this like one unifying sort of like direction. Whereas like um, Hillman seems to be more dispersed and sort of disintegrating in sort of his perspective and not moving towards a single point, but kind of trying to maintain uh, moving outward into uh, many perspectives or, um, you know, challenging uh, the kind of like one God, right? For sort of like the polytheistic point of view. Can you get into that a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head there, Aaron. Like, so, there, there are a few points that I would say, and, and that they're very significant points that Hillman diverges from Jung. So in, in the sense that he's he's a faithful Jungian to the extent that like Jung, he makes the archetype, uh, this idea of, of the archetype central to the to the psyche. It's, it's the fundamental datum of psychological life. Though, you know, as you said, I think, you know, for Jung, at the ground of the psyche is this notion that he called the, the self, the capital S self. Um, and one way to, to understand what Jung is, is talking about, or one way, one way to think about it, is it's, it's a center point that seems to bind and integrate all archetypal images around a common center and weaves them into a totality, which is to say that any archetypal figure um, is like a fragment. It's a partial face of this meta archetype that is the self, and it ultimately binds and integrates all multiplicity and particularly all polarity. Um, and this is something that Jung really picked up from like, like German romanticism, um, this, this idea that there are polarities at work in the depths that um, are being worked out not only in nature and progressing of like kind of at like the engine that progresses evolution, but that they're at work in the human psyche and human depths. And that's, that's also at work in a kind of progressive evolutionary process. So um, yeah, for Jung, th then this, the center of the self also has a kind of, um, it's like a teleological attractor. It's like the totality of the depths that we as human beings that are kind of partial outgrowths of this totality, um, we start out as a sliver, but then there's like this, almost like this gravitational pull to move toward that wholeness. And that's gonna pull us through a series of processes where we need to integrate what's not integrated and essentially enlarge the personality, enlarge the ego. The ego is gonna be enlarged in this process, which means just becoming conscious of and owning parts of ourselves that weren't previously conscious. And there's, there's, so there's like a developmental pull. And I think you, you know, Hillman rightly points that out. And as he said, it's, it's, he calls it a monotheism of the psyche that there's ultimately one kind of image. That's why Hillman's rallying cry is back to Greece because he wants to go back to the poly, a polytheistic um, notion of the psyche, which means that there's not a single center, there's not a single image, there's not um, an all-embracing totality, but that the psyche has many faces, many personalities. They can't simply be subsumed under um, like a larger order. And he, he wants to maintain that multiplicity and kind of stick with every archetype in and, of, in and for itself. And also with that, I think this is subtle because, you know, Hillman wrote this book called The Soul's Code. And in that book, he's playing with not only Plato, um, 
in the symposium, this the myth of Ur, which is this idea that you know we all uh, in incarnating descend with this kind of daimon that has the blueprint of our, our development and life, but we forget that, and then the daimon ex exudes its influence, and we. Uh, kind of follow a de an unconscious destiny, and Hillman's playing with this idea in that in that book um, calls it Acorn Theory. But it, if you read that in the larger spirit of Hillman, it's almost like he's picking this up as a way of looking. He's, this is this is one archetypal fantasy through which you can look at human life. But it, I, I think we're misreading Hillman if we really literalize a kind of meta, meta psychology around that for him. I don't think he's taking that. He doesn't take anything literally. In fact, deliteralizing things is his central uh, imperative. So anytime he's saying something, you want to step back and see him as kind of being self-reflexive about the kind of image or the kind of archetypal fantasy that's at work there. Um, so that's another place he differs from from Jung. It's like he, he talks about developmentalism, but at other times he rails on it and, and wants to say, like, if you're taking this literally, like, this is one fantasy, look at, there's all these other ways of conceiving uh, what's going on, each one rooted in a kind of image. There's one last piece where Hillman diverges significantly from Jung, um, which is also important. And this is that for Jung, Jung throughout his life, really till the end, even though when he started talking about synchronicity and started invoking this idea of the, the unus mundus or the psychoid nature of archetypes, um, he still had this like very Kantian epistemological framework, meaning that you know, he has the sense that all we have access to it are the the ways that the psyche is representing the world to us, but the world beyond the psyche is not something we can have direct access to. And then the way he would talk about archetypes, he would almost say like an archetype is something that that we can't ever know. We can only know the image, like archetypal images. We can only know the things that show up in our experience as images that are representations of archetypes but he did seem to regard the archetype as a thing in itself that's unknowable that exudes some kind of influence or some kind of effect on us um and so it's it's like this active force and he would even talk about archetypes they, they can be possessive they they have autonomy and so when we get possessed by an archetype it's almost as if this thing that exudes a force and exudes an effect is is taking hold of us and acting out its autonomy through us. And this kind of, in some ways, this is where he's closer to Freud because, you know, there's this notion of like the unconscious as something instinctual, something that actually has a kind of force to it and is pressing on our uh, biological being and impelling us into motion. Jung wrote this essay called Wotan uh, in the years leading up to World War II, where he was essentially saying that in Weimar Germany, there was a phenomenon that was happening that was um, becoming this sort of possession state and that there was this archetype of Wotan that was um, at work uh, in the in the kind of German collective uh, in the Third Reich. And he was looking at the phenomena that were happening and showing these metaphorical likenesses to the Wotan archetype. There's this wind that blows from place to place and this wandering that goes on and this kind of frenzied quality and activity. Um, and I think for, for Hillman, there's not a sense that archetypes are um, like exuding a kind of influence, like they actually have a force with which they possess us. It's more like they are perspectives that we can get caught up in and take literally. He, he would call them like that when we're under a, we're, one thing he says in the intro to revisioning psychology is that archetypes have a, he does say they have a possess, possessive effect, but in that, that they, they create a bedazzlement of consciousness such that it becomes blind to its own stance. So it means that we're under a kind of metaphorical way of looking at things. And to the extent that we take it literally and can't get distance from it, then we get into what he calls like metaphorical enactments. We play it out. So it's not necessarily that like an archetype is a thing out there that has an influence. It's just a, it's a metaphor, one of many possible metaphors. But if we take it too literally, then it's natural that we're just going to act out or we're going to behave in a way that is in accordance with 
with the impressions that come about if we think that that's literally um, what reality is like or literally the situation that we're in. So it's 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 got a kind of different flavor to it. So those are some kind of key differences between Jung and, and Hillman. I'm interested to lean in a little bit more to this idea of the differences. And on this last point about the archetypal dynamic, with Jung sort of looking at this more through the lens of the autonomy of the archetype and the unknowableness of it. And when it comes through, it ha is this force in people's lives. And I can see Hillman's point of view here that if we literalize the archetype, if we don't take it as its metaphor, we can get caught up in this sort of illusion. But I think maybe the Jungian counterpoint might be that we're not always conscious that an archetype is even present. And so how might one be in this process of literalizing if they're not fully present or aware to uh, this kind of archetypal force happening? And in that case, you know, it's Hilbin ultimately making some commentary on individuals who have brought that archetypal dynamic more into the ego's sphere of awareness. And how might he account for individuals who really aren't uh, paying attention to it consciously? Yeah, that's a good question. I sense a, a couple of places that this can go. Um, and this is this is something that's tricky about Hillman because <clears throat> and I, you know it's it's hard because he 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 brings in some quotes from Jung and and you know ideas that there there's always fantasy, there's always image activity going on in the unconscious, even for Jung. But it Overall, it seems like Jung can be read in such a way that a part of the goal of, of individuation is the attempt to um, get free of um, kind of the unconscious possession by the archetype and to have more freedom in relationship to them or in, a, in some way to um, allow the, uh, the freedom of the ego to kind of have more of its free play even though it's 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 still going to be archetypally informed because we do our, our personality structure is always going to be informed by by archetypal patterns but for hillman he really says we can never not be um under the spell of a certain archetype any perspective we take is always archetypally informed he always says that the soul is something i can't not but be in it and so in his writing style and revisioning psychology for example it's like he's in some ways he's like performing and through his rhetoric, um, through his rhetoric, he's kind of performing soul as he understands it, which you could just kind of get a sense that anytime he's saying something, he's shifting between archetypal modes, archetypal perspectives, and even trying to make you aware of the fact that he's doing it to be like, we're always in a metaphorical perspective, but we become self-reflexive about it. So that's, I think the process of becoming more conscious as far as Hillman is concerned. And this is where maybe we can get into a little, this will be a little excursion, but getting into the Neoplatonic influence and how this goes to like the central move of, of archetypal psychology, what he calls psychologizing or seeing through. Um, and this idea of seeing through, you know, he talks about what archetypes are. We, we see them and we see by means of them. So that to see through is, a, and is on one hand to look at the situation before us, not take it literally and see through its apparent literalism into the archetypal background that informs it. But that simultaneously is becoming aware of the fact that the archetype is like a metaphorical prism through which we're seeing. So we are seeing through an archetype and those conditions kind of co-arise um, I, I think to, to get toward Neoplatonism, um, and its influence on Hillman, like, uh, to illustrate, it, it might be even helpful to go back a little bit more to, um, what the, so Mircea Eliada, who was a great Romanian historian of religion, he has this great little book called Cosmos and History, the myth of the eternal return. And one of the things he talks about in that um, book is that, um, at least from his perspective, and I, I admittedly don't know a lot about the, the methodology he's using and how he's arriving at these conclusions um, and where he's basing them, but it's still illustrative that he's 
saying that amongst a lot of traditional societies, um, there's this sense that any action that's undertaken is rec like that any action that has validity within that context is it gains its validity because it models itself on a mythic figure right so that the the mythic figures um in the mythologies of these uh kind of traditional contexts they lay the foundation for everything that's meaningful meaning any meaningful activity has its basis in the mythic origins of that culture and that the, those mythic figures actually have ontological primacy meaning that their reality is primary and any action that models itself on an archetype then becomes valid as derivative from the mythological background so in order to guarantee one's being in order to establish one's ontological security their ex for their for existence to be valid you model yourself on an archetype right Ar arc the word archetype comes from the greek archai which essentially means a copy right so it's like it's it's to recognize oneself as a copy of a of a mythic figure in Eliades is this term in elo tempore or like in sacred time so mundane time is always derivative from the mythical patterns of sacred time um so th this is kind of illustrative or it lays a good kind of background for the kind of neoplatonic move that hillman's picking up on here which is that so in neoplatonism you, you know it's this if we start with like Plotinus, there's this emanationist cosmology, right? So you uh, originally you have the one, which is like the indescribably full pleroma of all reality. You can't really say anything about it because anything you say is already uh, a kind of diminution from the totality of the one where everything is, is undifferentiated, but it's the source of all. And that it, in its fullness, it emanates out into the noose right or into the the divine intellect the divine mind and this is ultimately where the archetypal ideas are in more of like the platonic sense that these are like the originary patterns the archai of which everything else is going to be derivative and a copy that flows out into the anima mundi or the world soul which is like the intermediary between now we have the kind of material uh world uh, the world of things where now everything has been very differentiated. It's fallen into multiplicity from the original unity. Soul is that place where the archetypal ideas of noose can enflesh themselves in the garb of the literal world such that things become a symbol for something more. If, if you can look with discernment, you can recognize that the literal... Uh, you could say disenchanted objects of the world, you can see through them and see the way that archetypal ideas are shining through them. Um, the ideas clothe themselves in seeming literal things and in so doing, gesture back to the ultimate source of things. Um, and this, this, within this cosmology though, it's like the destiny of everything. It flows out from the one and then it's ultimately destined to flow back. It all returns to the one. And this is this notion of epistrophe, and Hillman picks up on this term. Epistrophe is the is that return. Um, Proclus, a later um, Neoplatonist, then essentially looks at this this idea of epistrophe and says that well, these cycles happen on all levels. So yes, it starts with with the one, and it all flows back to the one. But then from nous, things flow, flow you know flow from their idea and then flow back to their idea. Um, and soul is going to be the kind of passage or the, the images are going to be the passage through which that happens. So epistrophe then becomes not just this kind of cosmological principle, but it becomes a kind of hermeneutic principle. It becomes a way of reading the world that when you, and so this is what, what Hillman says with epistrophe, epistrophe becomes the principle whereby things are led back to their origin and archetype. And this is why Corban was a big influence. Corban, who was essentially a Platonist or a Neoplatonist, but really grounded in the in Persian mysticism, Persian Sufism, which is very influenced by Neoplatonism. It's like where Neoplatonism flourished um, in the uh, Middle Ages or like the the late Middle Ages um, in Persia. 
this this term ta will, which means the same thing. It's it's the exercise whereby um, you can see the uh, you can read the esoteric or occult meanings in literal things. You can see the archetype at work. You lead something back to its archetype and origin, and it's kind of a contemplative uh, practice. So what Hillman's getting at then with epistrophe or ta will, he calls it a psychology of reversion. Right, so that we we look at things, we we see things, and then we lead them back to their archetype. We see through them, we see we see the archetype that's at work. That for him is is what is um, kind of at work and originating our experience. But this is the thing: Hillman's not really a Neoplatonist. He doesn't couch this in terms of that sort of cosmology. In fact, he's critical of having a spiritual. Um, perspective that would want to kind of get back to the one or get back to a kind of spiritual liberation. For him, it, everything starts and stops with soul. That, that's his grounding place. And so it's really just the soul is the, the kind of in-between or mediating quality whereby imagination is always at work in our experience and is always shaping our experience deepening it into experience by means of various archetypal patterns. And so becoming conscious of the unconscious for, for Hillman is really just developing uh, the, he, he, was call, he would call it developing an archetypal eye, developing a sensitivity of recognizing the metaphorical archetypal patterns and motifs that are always governing our experience and perception. But he's also really not saying that this is just something that's endemic to the human. In fact, he picked up on this idea of the anima mundi or the world soul. He's just like, wherever archetypes are showing up and they're, they're more ambiguous in their status, the, the soul is not limited to the human interior. It saturates everything. So that where an archetypal image shows up in any case, it's not a projection. It's not something we're putting on things per se. It's just, it's constellating. It's, it's just showing up right there as it is. So yeah, that's... Thank you, Sam. There, there's so much there, but I, I want to pull on this thread a little bit about the archetype that is at work and where we recognize this and we lead this back to like, what is this archetypal force or this mode of consciousness that's working through us? You know, from the Jungian point of view or the more classic Jungian point of view, we would put that in the context of the path of individuation and being able to create that dialectic between ego and the unconscious factors and sort of work to integrate those and to strengthen ego complex so that it you know doesn't get as overwhelmed. But if we're taking this viewpoint through Hillman and we're seeing the archetypes at play sort of as they are and how soul interacts with them, what does that path of soul enrichment, because I don't really want to call it individuation, but soul enrichment really look like? And is it just the process of becoming aware of these archetypes at play through us and through soul that Hillman says ultimately leads us to, um, I don't want to even say like being better or being more individuated, but just the, the work that he sees as valuable, is it just ultimately that process and being aware of it and dancing with it and that's where he wants people to sit versus you know the, the more classic Jungian view which at times wants us to pull out an analytical you know practical concrete idea or what telling us what it should do or where we're um lacking um so curious about your thoughts there yeah that's a Really good question. And I, I think the way, at least my sense in reading Hillman, is like the way you framed it. I think that's kind of where he, where he's always trying to, to get us to stay. You know, he's always like soul making, stay with soul, deliteralize, um, kind of find that, that deeper aesthetic, depersonalize what's going on and just go back to like that. This is, this is not literal, always find the metaphor and just engage in that exercise. And that this contrasts the idea that the ego is something that is developing. We want to have a healthy, strong ego, right? As opposed to one that um, needs to be shored up and is kind of blown around by these influences. And 
it seems like Hillman's imperative is actually to frustrate and dethrone the ego. Um, and that's why reading him can be really frustrating. And especially where it's like the, you know, the aspect of ourselves where we want, for instance, our dream work, um, we want our therapy to be about something that, that, that feels like it's serving us and, um, bolstering and furthering our yearnings and aims and strivings to develop and actualize something in the world. You know, Hillman is, is constantly, um, trying to bruise that part of ourselves, I think. And this is, this is also part of, um, uh, what he calls pathologizing is that, you know, if, if we think of the ego in terms of the hero archetype, he thinks that our cultures come to overly enshrine the hero archetype and that we completely identify with it and neglect the many other voices, the many other gods that are at work in, in, um, in the psyche. And therefore our neuroses are really where other gods are demanding their due, you know? And so by always thwarting the ego's purposes and say like, yeah, you're on this track, but like this thing's nagging at you and you're suffering. And then when you come and listen to it, you're going to descend and you're going to deepen into uh, where the soul is full of pain and pathology and kind of the contortion and disfigurement in its images, which for Hillman are not personal. They actually belong to the soul. Um, there's, uh, I, I just was reminded of this um, statement by Hillman from um, a, a Dharma teacher named Robert Bea, who was very influenced by Hillman and uh, sort of transmitted this teaching called the soul making Dharma, which is incredibly beautiful and very rich, but he says, uh, you know, Hillman talks about a pain finding its God. And that's sort of what therapeutics is about is a pain finding its God or finding its archetypal ground, its archetypal basis. Um, so I do think that that's, that's Hillman's overriding imperative, but, you know, sometimes I have to wonder Hillman's position, his rhetoric, his sort of stance that that he found which is very original and he kind of has this thing and he hits it home and he he became like the kind of um paramount gadfly of the Jungian world i think where he's trying to to shake things up and maybe find those dogmatic pillars and kind of rock them loose a little bit and and maybe wanting to counteract some of the tendency toward narcissism that can come up when we get so fixated on our individuation process and like who you know where am i where am i becoming how am, what's my individuation process up to um he's really wanting to like dislodge that um egocentrism or that that heroics you know and like open up to something that's very kind of impersonal an impersonal imagination that that is there for its own sake right um Though I, I wonder if he was, I wonder how self-reflexive he was about being a gadfly and maybe how tongue in cheek he might have been about that, that maybe he didn't even fully take himself literally, you know, it's hard to know. And, and this is one of the things that's always kind of bothered me about Hillman a little bit, not bothered me, but it feels unresolved. And you can maybe sense this in, um, in Nietzsche, and I remember it was Richard Tarnas who first pointed this out to me, that you know Nietzsche was famous, you know, called the po father of postmodernism for a good reason, and that he was um, situating most visions, most totalizing visions, as oriented in a certain perspective, and that you can decenter those, and you can question them, you can append them and contradict them, and then ultimately he says, you know, that. Uh, you say that truth is 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 what is all there is. I say that truth is precisely what there is not. There is only perspective, right? But the issue is that okay, sh to make that claim, you would have to kind of transcend that condition in order to establish that as a truth. If everything is perspective, you have to transcend the um, inescapable perspective, like perspectival nature of things, to even assert that as a truth something similar is going on with Hillman where he's saying that we're always uh, in one archetype or another. None of them are, are the last word. Uh, we should have fluidity. We should always be open to multiplicity and be self-reflexive. But where's that meta point from which he can make that perspective clear and have consistency? 
It's almost like he has to be in some sense outside of a certain archetypal perspective to make that claim and have it hold up without just seeing through that as well, right? So there's a, there's something uh, tricky and unresolved there. It's like it's almost like well, I see through that, and you're you're under the archetypal um, fantasy of Archimedes trying to get off the the earth and you know like use a lever on it. Um, so that's a little tricky, you know. And so uh, in terms of this tension, like I. It's it's nice to hold Jung and Hillman in this tension and see Jung as that force that's always trying to break open the totality of 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 the kind of Jungian vision of the psyche, like like the Zen Enzo. You know, it's like it's open. It it kind of doesn't doesn't close in on itself. Um, you you're always trying to be wary of a partial perspective that gets too locked into a sense of its literalism, a sense of its completeness, a sense of its totality. But at the same time, I think Jung's always there pulling toward integration, affirming those dimensions of our depth that I think have a natural yearning uh, and longing for many of the things that um, Jung's vision is uh, gesturing towards and situating us within. That something about the process of becoming, something about the impulse toward integration, um, toward wholeness. Um, th I think that's always at work too, you know, so there's a, there's a generative tension between those. And I think there's this um, complexity thinker named Ed Edgar Moran, a French thinker who has this idea of the unitas multiplex. It's like unity and multiplicity. And I mean, th there, there are pre there's foundations of that in romanticism as well, talking about unity and multineity and things like this, but this tension between the one and the many um, as a kind of juicy point. And I think Jung and, and Hillman always hold that, but Hillman was, is, a, is, is an effective and uh, necessary gadfly, I think in some ways, and it's hard to shake him off your back. <laughs> I wonder if you see Hillman as being um, a figure who's trying to plunge back into the shadow constantly and that you know you're talking about like um the kind of the worshiping of the ego or worshiping of the hero and forgetting about everything that's beneath and that um it's important to uh uh have your pain find the right god in some sense right so with yun in some ways can name this sort of like heading towards the light like kind of heading towards like the self which is sort of like you know like this sort of like beautiful um top of the pyramid kind of thing. And if uh, Hillman is sort of like, if you essentially saying like, if you do that, you're going to ignore a huge part of reality and you're going to repress a lot of um, the multiplicity that's inside you. Um, and if that's sort of like Hillman's deal is trying to prevent people from being so reductionist about their ideas and thoughts and their, and their, their methods and their therapy, and to constantly be trying to like rip that down, disintegrate that back down, like into the shadows, because uh, that's where like, the real fertility is there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I think you're you're on to something there. And I, I think that the things that Hillman pokes at and you know kind of goads um, in terms of where certain perspectives get too comfortable. Um, it is a confrontation with shadow in a certain way. And at the same time, I think for him, the ultimate shadow is literalism. That's like the, that, that's the ultimate shadow he's wanting to unearth. And at the same time, there's a way that I think Jung gave a lot more gravity to the shadow. Like the shadow is something to contend with. It's actually quite terrifying. And there's this notion, you know, like, whereas like Hillman is really looking to the Neoplatonists, um, Someone actually wrote a, a really interesting essay about Neoplatonism and uh, pointed out that Jung didn't really spend a lot of time uh, citing them. They don't show up very often in his work. He was much more rooted in like the church fathers and the theological debates through the Middle Ages, particularly on this notion of the privatio boni, right? Which is to say, is, is, is evil a metaphysical element in itself with substantiality or is it just the absence of good? And Hillman, I mean, Jung really wasn't into that idea of the privatio boni. That like, there's no such thing as evil. It's just an absence of good. It's a, it's 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 where good isn't. 
and he was more into, you know, early theologians who actually saw the divine in terms of the complexio oppositorum, and that actually good and evil are mutual, mutu uh, co-arising aspects of something, and therefore we're in this moral conundrum, and we always have to master the shadow. And if we don't, then we're going to act it out, and it's going to be extremely destructive. And in Hillman, there's almost like there's not that same gravity in a certain way. He's 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 less um, wary of the psyche than Jung was. He's less um, he has less gravity around the destructive potentials of it. He's more like a artisan um, or more like somebody who wants to. Uh, appreciate the aesthetics of the psyche, appreciate the poetics of the psyche. Um, and this isn't to say that he didn't have his concerns. Um, in fact, he, he was pretty, he was actually a pretty political person. And like in, in the nineties in particular, he wrote these essays on the anima mundi and the world soul, but then like beauty is like a political, like, like the politics of beauty or the political efficacy of be beauty. And he, he was concerned about what industrial civilization was doing on the planet um, and really wanting to rebel against that and thinking that if we sensitize ourselves to beauty and talking about beauty as aesthesis, so like aesthetics, um, which he, aesthesis means like to just perceive, like sense perception, but he, he also links it to other Greek words that actually mean like to breathe in. Like, and um, for him, like beauty is the place where like we draw in the world, we take it in. Um, and for him, I think that would be a way that like a lot of the shadow of humanity would be, um, he, he felt that like a lot of the things we act out create ugliness. And he, he actually really wanted to combat against ugliness and said that like, if we, if we sensitized ourselves to the soul, if we sensitized ourselves to beauty, then we would revolt against so much of the ugliness of the world. And we would inherently want to create something more um, beautiful, more aesthetic. He even talks about cosmos, like to create a cosmos. He links that to the to the root word of cosmetics, and um, that there's actually like a, an aesthetic dimension to having a cosmos. There's beauty is is central to it, which is why I think he he thought that that's why Plotinus said that the soul is always an Aphrodite. What does that mean? It's like the goddess of beauty that the the soul speaks itself aesthetically. It speaks itself in beautiful forms. Um, so. Yeah, you know that that's that's where you get Hillman's like kind of concern and his gravity or his, his his motivation. But at the same time, like Hillman's, he's he's pulling on a shadow, but there's also a sense that like th there there there's less gravity or there's less concern around the shadow. You just get less of like a heaviness around Hillman. I think maybe because he's like uh, you know like I think his allegiance was just to the the truth of the imagination, you know, to like the soul in itself. That's where he would always want to go back. So that whatever suffering, whatever tragedy or calamity is there, you can always trace it like that. There's something eternal behind it. And maybe that's a little too relaxed, you know, maybe that doesn't quite get at the gravity of things quite enough. So yeah, that that's kind of like a roundabout way of um, kind of reflecting on, on that, that question of shadow with Hillman. And from my understanding, Hillman in opposition to the union of the polarity is um, seems to want us to just sort of dance between the reality that there one is always there. And if we try to transcend them both into something new, we're, we're kind of discarding the essence of what those polarities were in the first place. And maybe even the idea of polarities in the first place is, is flawed, you know? And so rather than the the union of opposites it's more like well when we talk about one aspect we recognize that maybe there are multiple or an opposing force um that's always there so like when he talks about cenex he's going to talk about the puer as well and rather than say that we should transcend the cenex puer axiom we should instead just flow between the two and know that whenever Puer is present somewhere standing just behind it is like, you know, the, the shadow of the Senex. And if you want, you can just quickly turn towards that and be with it and move through it and have it influence you. Um, but it does sort of create what I think is, is, is kind of chaotic energy of Hillman's work. And I think that's why certain 
people, maybe especially in a classical Jungian sense, feel uncomfortable in it, in that where do we orient to then? Because even this idea of just orient to soul then, orient to what the image is, orient to what's coming up. Well, the multiplicity makes it so that there's this range of potential at any moment. And how does one ground into that? And the ability to move nimbly from one image to another or from one archetype to another is actually quite an overwhelming experience. And I think as all philosophies are, it's a real like revelation and sort of reflection of the philosopher themselves. And I think when I read Hillman, I get that sense of that powerful uh, intuitive function and, and thinking function that he really has, but that he can hold so many perspectives at once and not feel overwhelmed by it. But when I talk about this with others and certain questions I've got, it's like, well, what do I do with that? Or how do I orient then to my dream images that are coming up? Or how do I work with the Sonics and the Pu'er and Aphrodite? It's very overwhelming for people. Mm-hmm. So what, you know, what do you do? And I think almost Hillman would say, just, just, just dance in the chaos, right? Just be with it. Uh-huh. But that's, that's hard. That's hard for people to work with. And I'm especially curious for you bringing in some of these ideas more into the clinical space, you know, what does that look like in a more concrete manner as you work uh, with clients? Mm. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And to be honest, like, I I could only imagine, and you know, actually my, um, a, f- a friend and colleague of mine named Jason Butler wrote a book called, um, I think archetypal therapy and he was wrestling with this question like okay so what is what is like how does Hillman apply to actual clinical work <laughs> you know and he he's he's looking at that and trying to unpack it but it's a hard question to 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 answer and i i would imagine it really comes down to like the what what you might call like the analytic attitude that's brought in you know that there would be a kind of reverence and there would be a, a sense that um you'd approach what's coming up as a dream or as a fantasy and then it's like an art of where are people stuck or or where is this fantasy too rigid and where can we loosen loosen it up find other ways of looking recognize that actually so much of what's arising if it's reified and it's causing suffering can be rooted in the way of looking it's rooted in the perspective that's at work and there can be an artistry of dreaming that forward and arc an artistry of, I mean, Hillman was really good at doing like reversals and things like that. You'd, you'll find that like, you know, he's talking about for instance, um, hypochondria and saying like, um, is hypochondria the, um, the imagination of suffering or is it actually the suffering of the imagination? You know, he, he, he that's like, did these little twists all the time. Um, but I think there's a, there's a sense of, recognizing that what's arising is ultimately metaphorical you don't take it too literally and then you can find a kind of artistry and recognize that if the suffering is poetic um, it can either be beautified or or redeemed like redeemed in a certain way made more bearable by being um, uh, finding a way of holding it that reveals its beauty or that we can find new frames we can find new fantasies to dwell in if we can really care for and 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 be with this fantasy is i mean is hillman and like either as a philosophy or as a psychology particularly turned toward clinical practice enough is he sufficient on his own i don't think so i i I couldn't uh ultimately be uh nourished and satisfied by just holding um a kind of hillmanian standpoint on its own but as something to hold in relation to other perspectives to pick up and put down as needed it can it can introduce things that are um that are helpful and you know so this is bringing me to one last piece in in line with your question there was so much that was uh coming up and, and pinging around as you were speaking um but yeah, you know, Hillman can play with the idea of oppositional uh, oppositionalism or the the polarities and Senex and, and Puer is one that you mentioned where there's clearly a kind of um, uh, 
uh, yin and yang to those, or there's a complementarity to those that one implies the other. But I think also, as you mentioned, um, and you alluded to, I th if I'm pretty sure it's in the dream in the underworld that there's there's a section where, where, you, where Hillman kind of takes aim at, at op oppositionalism and the Jungian tendency to, to look at things too readily in terms of opposites and holding the balance of the opposites and saying that what that can do is sometimes we can draw um, like we can draw things into the fantasy of being in opposition or being that kind of contrary when there's really just a multiplicity at work and there's just a difference. And sometimes we want to shake that up. And so there's, there's this, he, something he's, he's gone into before too, is like homeopathy rather than allopathy. So rather than kind of balancing something with the opposite tendency and holding that tension, finding where something becomes one-sided and finding the other principle to, to bring about the tension, which would have a kind of, would ultimately have an integrative and ideally teleological or, or transformative function um, in Jung's perspective. Sometimes Hillman's saying like, we can take an allopathic approach, which means we use, we, you know, Plotinus would say that um, all knowledge comes about through likenesses. Right, so there's this um, finding light, like pairing like with like, or this idea that the solution to a particular suffering is actually in the same archetypal fantasy, just inflected a little bit differently. And I guess the best way I could try to like get at like an illustration of what that might mean, if I can like lean on, for instance, like astrological archetypes and think about Saturn, because this is a particularly multivalent uh, archetype. But it's, it's, you got to introduce some some notion of oppositionalism or, or, or dipolarity as well, because you could say that Saturn has its life affirming and um, uh, challenging aspects, or it has its light and it has its shadow. So that if you're in the shadow of Saturn and say you're being um, being met with consequences, right, that there are things coming from without that have the Saturnian dimension, like punishment or retribution or negative consequences that are a hindrance. The solution to that can also be uh, brought about through the same Saturn archetype that said, well, you're getting the negative side of Saturn coming from without because you're not uh, actively embodying it from within and enacting it in ways of like responsibility, thoughtfulness, foresight, um, you know, these sort of things. So it's like the, there's like a homeopathic idea. And that, that's the way that you can get into an archetypal perspective. And it's also a very concrete way of thinking, which is actually incidentally pre Saturnian. Um, but you know that that that's one one aspect so it's i think in clinical work it's um yeah trying to understand like where is fantasy at work where is the suffering actually not literal and is brought about by the way of looking and can can be guided can be massaged can be ushered into different fantasies different ways of looking uh, either different metaphors or different possibilities within the same metaphorical complex that can open things up, that can loosen things, that can reveal new possibilities, or even just reframe the way something is being imagined. Um, and, you know, just, just to your last point, like uh, William Irwin Thompson, uh, this writer, talks about his writing styles like mind jazz. And, like, there is a way that, like, Hillman is very mind jazzy. He just riffs, you know, he's incredibly erudite, there, you know, very learned scholar but he's he's just kind of all over the place and he's he's having fun he's riffing you know but it's not very it's not it's not systematic he's not a systematic thinker yeah um we're almost at the top of the hour uh probably last question um if someone wanted to sort of implement some of james coleman's ideas or get into archetypal psychology as a form of self-work what might they do in practical terms? How, how might they play with these ideas in a kind of accessible, practical way? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. In some ways, that's one of the hardest ones to answer. Um, For sure. And it's funny because I want to like revert more to like Jungian ideas about, or even transpersonal psych ideas about um, about archetypal reality. Although you can even stick within the, the Neoplatonic way of thinking. And the reason this is tricky is because from one perspective, you could, you could think of the, that the archetypes, um, they used to just be self-evident. Like they used to just be a, like something that saturated human experience and it didn't take effort to see or think archetypally. It didn't feel unnatural, but that something about what came on partic with particular strength in the late Renaissance, 
and something that had to do with the formation of the modern self and like an extremely consolidated ego that really feels like it's over and against the world and is very kind of rational. Um, something about the process that gave rise to that seemed to occlude the um, the presence of, of the archetypal, like, like when the sun's rising, you know, if you think of like the, the, the sun as a symbol for the ego, you know, for the hero, once it rises, it occludes the, the starry backdrop. So you can't see the night sky anymore that there's something like, like you can think about it like that. It can be hard to think archetypally or can even feel arbitrary because we don't experience them as direct presidents as direct presences anymore. Um, we have to, almost penetrate back into something that is unconscious for us. It takes effort. You know, that's for, ne for Neoplatonists, it was like a, it was gnosis, you know, and there was a contemplative dimension to it. Um, I think that in, in some ways, I mean, I would argue that honestly, it's like psychedelic experience does open us back up to that archetypal mode of perception. And we can recognize these um, kind of meta metaphorical or symbolic qualitative um, meaningful patterns again in those uh, experiences. But what, what what Hillman would say is that, and he actually argued this, that he thought that like psychology understood as the discipline of soul itself is best understood through the humanities. That's why he, he co-founded the um, Dallas Institute for um, uh, Culture and the Humanities. He thought that like cultural history, even pop culture, um, anywhere where the human person is at, is at the at the forefront, personality, historical figures, right, Be, being up to things, or just actors playing certain uh, roles, literature, things like that. That's where the archetypal patterns are most um, evident. So you get you just like you study cultural history, you study literature, you study art, um, cultural history. And just try to see where are the personages at work, where are the where's where's personifying happening, where's personality at play, and trying to also have some sense of mythology, some sense of our like being informing yourself with. Uh, he he would turn to Greek mythology first because he thought that it was a particularly very differentiated, very rich um, pantheon, and just finding again uh, Plotinus right. Knowledge comes from likeness. Where do you see the likenesses? training yourself with that archetypal eye to recognize that there's a kind of metaphorical root that makes it possible to even see analogies between people, between events, between happenings in your life and archetypal situations. And if you practice that, um, eventually, ideally, it gets to the point where it's not just something that seems arbitrary, but that you're actually having a sense that there is a genuine presence there's a genuine power there's a there's a genuine source from which all of these things spring and which is the condition for their likeness you know just like those you know doing an action and recognizing that the mythological figure is the is the source is the foundation it's being as primary or being as derivative um that that's one way of approaching it but it's 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 hard and it's very easy to slip out of that and it's it's, it's hard to kind of keep an archetypal eye at all times so, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Um, I think one maybe rebuttal to Arun's point is that, you know, Hillman would say it's not really about finding these concrete actions to take, but more just this shifting of perspective that kind of flows in and flows out. And that in and of itself is like a very frustrating response, right? But the frustration is is the point of, of interesting consciousness to have. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. So um, everyone, thanks for following along and commenting. Sam, thank you so much for all of your wisdom. It was lovely to have you and uh, tune in next time for another live stream. <laughs>If you find our content useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow org. If you'd like to keep up with my explorations, musings, and stay updated on the project, subscribe to the Golden Shadow Journal at goldenshadow.substack.com. Thanks for watching. See you later. Yeah.